Good morning, good uh, afternoon, actually, uh, to all of you. Uh, welcome to the final session. And you know the, the title, of course, of the rencontre, how to succeed to, to uh, transform the world, conventional uh, meeting in line with the habits of the circle of the economies. That is, we'll hear first Hélène Ray, who is uh, a professor at the uh, European Business School, and then the uh, the speakers will take the floor for five minutes each. And then, after that, we will take your questions. Let me introduce the speakers. Hélène, I've just done that. There's Cynthia Fleury, who is a philosopher, uh, and uh, Fazia Koufi, who is a former vice president of the uh, Afghanistan parliament. Mariage, Mar Jacques Main, who is a reporter, Abhijit Banerjee, a professor at the Boston MIT, and he's also an Economy Nobel Prize winner. And finally, next to me, Dominique de Villepin, a former Prime Minister of France. So, Hélène. Uh, set the stage. Thank you, Francois. So, let's be clear, the topic of the panel is quite ambitious because we have to succeed in transforming the world. So, so wherever we look, the request for fundamental changes prevail in climate, in pandemics, in biodiversity, or even in societal domains. And we know that in many cases, we know what to do. We do sometimes even we do have the technologies that could make could make things move forward. We also know that the cost of the lack of action are huge. Yet, yet, in most cases, we wait. We we are like paralyzed, stalled. We don't do much or nothing. Or we let me give you three examples quickly. First example, the pandemics. When COVID uh, occurred, we were able to produce vaccines and rapidly, actually. It was amazing. But we were not able to provide vaccine for the, total, the whole world. In 2021 already, there was a note from the IMF indicating that the benefits of global vaccination would be 9,000 billion dollars for a fairly res limited cost of 50 billion US dollars. Now, if we had vaccine the whole world, this would have made possible to avoid disturbances in production chain lines, trade, and reduce the likelihood of advent of variants. In the economic, uh, in economic terms, the return rate of for the vaccination of all countries was absolutely huge and i'm not talking about the human uh, cost and even though if cost had been fully covered by the european union alone this would have been a huge huge investment a phenomenal investment this investment cost would have contributed to reduce the problems of public finances in europe and especially in france but we didn't do it. So, whereas this would have been in the interest of all, and especially in our own interest, and at the human level, at the sanitary level, uh, from a social standpoint, and the economic standpoint, and even in the interest of public finances. Second example, climatic, climate risks are no longer in a far away horizon that we could ignore. Our budget, carbon budget will, de will depleted in eight years if we limit ourselves to 1.5 degree uh, warming up and 25 years if we want to limit it to two degrees, that is tomorrow. Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England in 2015 talked about the uh, tragedy of the horizons. Let me mention him. The catastrophic impact of climate will be felt well beyond the horizon of most of the current players, imposing costs on future generations that uh, the current generations are not in, uh, invited to lower. OK, this is the tragedy of horizons. But horizon has uh, shrunk, and uh, we've discovered 
in addition with the war in Ukraine, that transition to a decarbonated economy is the key for our energy independence. Therefore, we must transform ourselves and transform the world with us because Europe is produces only 8% of global emissions. So we, with the US, China, India, have to transform themselves. And the cost of lack of action are very high, possibly almost infinite. We do have some technologies to do decarbonation. There are uh, leads to transform our economies and societies, which are very promising yet. And although Europe and France are uh, leading, we do not make headways collectively. Why? Well, we could, without any cost for society, we could stop bitcoins, which uh, consume about the power, co consume as much power as Vietnam alone, and would we'll make it, uh, and uh, we'll have less fraud as well. Le so, third example, biodiversity. And this is the cornerstone of our activities. We were able to count on the dividend by the planet, you know, in terms of biosystems and beauty for tourism, for economic business activities and well-being. But biodiversity is depleted and cost is huge. We still talk about it and we don't have any uh, measure of biodiversity that would be reliable and, and uh, we don't even know what is our dependency or dependence to, to uh, biodiversity. So why do we uh, wait? Why don't we take care of the common goods? Well, I think uh, a lot of you feel, and uh, well, I do feel that the, uh, it should be a study that would not be done in silo. We need acute sense of priorities, good assessment of order of magnitude. Don't spend time, energy and money on small problems and political courage. In all these transformations, the cooperation, be it at the local level or at the regional global level, is a central element of success. So our future is collective, but it is for us to determine in which field cooperation should be done and mostly how to fuel them and implement them. Back to Denis Kessler, we are now facing the long-term urgency and the panel with div different experience will certainly enlighten us on all this. Thank you. Justement, s'adresse aux terriens. We're going to talk now about a charter uh, with uh, many encouragements for we uh, human beings. Hello, everybody. I'm really delighted to be with you today. I'm going to uh, answer the question from my point of view. I'm in the humanity and healthcare chair, and I also <laughs> occupy the philosophy chair at hospital in Paris for psychiatry and neuroscience. This is very important that I point this out because we wanted to reinvent hospitals. We thought that it was a really nodal point and uh, that a city uh, is, survives and a, and a country survives if it has a good uh, hospital system. We have to have medical humanities at the very heart of the redesign of our development aid. So you asked me about hurdles. Well, we have certain individuals who are going to dig their heels in, first of all, because the cost of change, well, when you weigh the cost of, when you can put that charge upon someone else's shoulder, then you do it. So you're going to try and find someone who is more vulnerable than yourself. And so long as that vulnerable person can uh, shoulder that uh, burden, then we will shift that burden to their shoulders. So there are many physical laws, economical laws, but there are also uh, psychological laws. I am not for um, analyzing history on the, um, in the, uh, in detail, but I think we must be sure that we uh, mustn't be reactionary in, in our actions. So I, in my philosophy chair at uh, the hospital, I focus on the micro micro scale. What on earth might that be? Well, this is the vulnerability of the individual. So the smallest unit, if you like, 
And we work on the capacities of that vulnerability. We have a design theory based on that vulnerability. So rather than considering vulnerability, rather than denying that it exists, we're going to map it out. So we stop pretending that uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's, it's systemic, in fact. But uh, these, uh, they are also anthological. So we start off with a vulnerability, that of an individual or an organization. And let me give you an example. For example, if we take a look at the hospital itself, we go directly to work on the uh, clinic for the carers who are suffering from burnouts. We've got a protocol of how we heal these carers so that the hospital that cares will continue to care properly. We are also going to take a look. We've got a chair uh, at the Pansy Hospital. Uh, why did we go to that particular place? We went because it's. Uh, we've been able to identify around the world some hot spots of vulnerability. And these vulnerability hotspots, the same way as they exist, as there are biodiversity uh, hotspots, you know what one of those is. It's a, it's an area, or areas in the future. There are systems which account for two to three percent of the land ecosystem, but which regulate between thirty and sixty percent of ecosystemic services. So it's all important. We do the same thing by identifying on the planet some vulnerability hotspots. The hospital of Ponzi is um, war violence, uh, uh, wife beating, all that kind of stuff. And we take care of that spot and invent resilience protocols based on those vulnerabilities. And then we disseminate them to other places. So those are just a few examples so that I respect my five minute time slot. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you very much for giving us those concrete examples, and thank you for being so surprised. Fosia Kufi now. President of the Afghan Parliament. You left Afghanistan last September, but, and you live now in London, but you are still one of the leading voice of uh, Afghanistan. So we are very pleased to welcome you today and to have you with us. Thank you, sir. Um, I hope the translation is good and everybody can hear and because I don't want to confuse you further about uh, the situation. Um, I think when we speak of transformation for people uh, who live in, in Europe and West, um, it's completely different concept uh, to where I come from, to my parts of the world. Um, Afghanistan and countries that are in conflict um, or countries that are suffering from humanitarian crisis, uh, human rights crisis, political crisis. Um, in my country, the politics of exclusion uh, obviously is the main challenge and I think it's all over the world. Um, we cannot claim of transformation if our politics is on the basis of discrimination discrimination on the basis of gender, on the basis of religion, on the basis of ethnic, race, or any personal you know, kind of identity. And unfortunately, up to now, still, the world politics is occupied by the exclusion on the basis of discrimination. We hardly have countries um, that really overcome this um, um, you know, lack of political willing. If you see how many uh, countries are now led by women, it probably doesn't go beyond my finger counts. Um, you know, how many Muslim countries actually are led by women, it's even worse. But in my country, it's much worse than you can imagine. Of course, in the last, uh, uh, just to give you a little idea, Afghanistan is not chronically a poor country. We are a country full of natural resources, as you can imagine. Um, we have an important geographical location that connects Central and South Asia. Um, we have a very young population, very dynamic. These are all our potential economic opportunities that could be utilized. However, uh, as I said before, conflict and politics of exclusion has been the main barrier. In the last 20 years, after 2001, we have tried to 
you know, somehow use these potentials. And for me, coming from a, a, a rural area in Afghanistan, being the first woman to be educated in my family, and in fact, in my community, I just believe that education is the fundamental for progress and transformation. Probably you wouldn't, you won't relate to what I say because in your parts of the country, you take education for granted. But in my part of the country, in my country, still, um, you know, uh, people, uh, is, especially girls, are not allowed to go to school under the pretext of religion. Now you, you, you are hearing, but in the last 20 years, what we have tried to do is to try to empower communities by educating them, empower women, empower girls, empower boys, so that they connect. They connect to technology, they connect to you know, opportunities, and they bring this new ideas and innovation, innovation into their communities, into their societies. Because I think one of the challenges in our parts of the world is also connectivity. The fact that we are not connected, there is no roads, there is no you know, um, uh, public transport to the extent that it should be. These are main challenges for people to access uh, social services. For instance, I know that you know, people from as far as like eight days of walking, all the way walk to come to a French hospital in Kabul. It's easy to say it, it's all very impossible to imagine and be in that situation. So education and connectivity is the two main thing that we have tried to um, overcome. And we have overcome, 11 million children went to school before, over, before Taliban uh, take the country. But unfortunately, out of that 11 million children, which four, four millions were girl, now, uh, almost one million girls go to school. Girls from beyond grade six are not allowed to go to school. Almost there is a gender apartheid. So as long as we continue to oppress the societies, to exclude them, obviously the society will not uh, enjoy transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. very much. Marine Jacquemin, we're staying in Afghanistan with you. You have uh, witnessed 60 or so conflicts in uh, five years, but you also have a personal commitment at stake. Please pick up the mic. Does it work? Yes, yeah, fine. Okay. This is the first time I'm speaking in public, so I'd just like to say that one day an Afghan woman said to me that 1% of your wealth would be all we need. 1%, that's all. So that makes you stop and think. I live in the world of war. The world is changing with war. We have these uh, arms merchants who are growing richer, journalists such as myself. We cover wars and chaos and distress. And we come home, you know, as if nothing had changed. Uh, we don't really talk about these things with our families because it's upsetting for them. And we say, sooner or later, or rather, what we say that things are getting, it's harder to come home after a report out in the field, even in terms of our ethics. Uh, you just can't uh, wash your hands of everything. One day I came back from a report and there were some images which really shocked me. A young child walked on a mine, got blow up. We had a translator with us. He was hung by the Taliban. And I said to myself, this just cannot go on. This is impossible. So it all began by uh, constructing a little haven of peace in Kabul. My translator had taken me to a hospital one day and said, Maureen, we will build this back again together. And I remembered all of that and I decided that building a haven of peace on, in a, on a minefield and in a country which is riddled with war for generations, it would require a lot of determination, of course, but having such a project carries you so far. It's like a sacred mission that you've got. You'll do anything. You'll knock on any door. You'll share. You'll shake hands which are not outstretched. You would even shake hands with the devil. But you have to do everything to uh, 
succeed. There were lots of um, negative reports. People were saying, why Kabul? Why, Kabul? why don't you do this in France? There are these people with fine words. They never do anything. There were those who were envious. But you just have to move forward all the same. And you have to move forward with fear in your gut. For years, I covered 35 years of war, and I've always been afraid because that fear protects you. But by the same token, fear must not guide you. There are many other things. There are uh, some really important moments you've got to go forward. I was with some soldiers once who'd been with me to see the number two of the Taliban's. I decided to meet that person because I wanted to win him over. I wanted to convince him that my project was not a kind of gadget. It was a thing that was long lasting and I wanted him to, to get on board with it. I said it was a project for women and, and children, but it was also a project for him, for his family, for his children. And he too had to be committed and and I was asking him not to come into the hospital. He had the right to do so, but I asked him not to come in there with his weapons and his bombs and so that women wouldn't go in wearing their, their veils. But sadly, the, the women were forced to put those veils and burqas on later on in several years, several years down the line. But I wanted to create this... Uh, uh, bubble of freshness, bubble of cool in this uh, heated country, and they would come in their hundreds. So the conditions were respected, and so now for 20 years this hospital has been up and running. It's been saving thousands of children thanks to this chain of hope, which works. Uh, we have uh, heart surgeons that can operate four hearts a day. Uh, we work on the disabled, we give them operations, and it has created a huge family at the heart of Kabul. People come and they bring us children who are already dead, and they want us to save them. I just can't express it. It's just a, a catastrophe. I recently saw some footage of the, of the Taliban returning. It's heartbreaking. I knew they were going to come back because we have the watch, but they have the time. And so the hospital no longer works as it did, it's kind of hopping around on one leg. The hospital will outlive us, I'm sure, because one day Madame Chirac said, well, it's uh, great to build a hospital, but then you have to run that hospital and find the right manager for it. And I found Zara Agacon, the best hospital manager with her father's foundation. And what I'm telling you today, what you've just heard, is I put my tiny drop in this ocean of misery. But you who are listening to me, you are the 1%. And you, in your pocket, have another little droplet, which will make that, when you think about this, you will change the world. That's what transformation is. Thank you, Mr. Abujit Bedaji. Uh, you to welcome one of the leading economists in the world. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's uh, it, one thing, one very good uh, predictor of which countries did reason better in terms of dealing with COVID was uh, the trust in government. And and as we think, think of the world, think of the charge that Ellen gave us of you know, all the things we can do and should do, I think all of them, the, the fact of having faith in government is central to them. Unfortunately, in the, just in the last 20 years or 15 years, the, the fraction of the population in the West who say they have trust in government has declined by 25%, and it continues to decline. So we're really in, in a point where we need the trust in government. We need it for everything. We're dealing with COVID, where who should get the vaccine, who should not. Uh, and, you know, and you can see that where there is less trust in government, like in the United States, people just invented uh, narratives about how they could be damaged by the vaccines and didn't get vaccinated. And as a result, millions continue to die. Uh, but in, in, and, if you think of climate change, I mean, all of, 
any action on any of these issues that um, Ellen highlighted will require a certain amount of forbearance. We need to be able to act now to do, take policies which will certainly have some, uh, you know, hurt some people, and we'll have to be able to tell them that, look, yes, but we will somehow make you whole. I mean, and in particular, in, in think about uh, what's critical to, you know, uh, carbon taxation. Carbon taxes are typically in a country like France, they hurt, hurt the poor. The people who don't live in metropolitan cities who have to drive cars. And for all of those people, we need to be able to credibly say, we will somehow make you whole. And we have, and, and, the, the, and the reason why I think there is so little action on so many of these things is critically connected and why the US, for example, is moving in the opposite direction right now, the politics moving to the right, it has critically connected to the failure, systematic failure of governments to build trust. And, but this extends beyond, I think, uh, just within countries. I think the narrative of uh, government failure, one uh, that my community of economists have often contributed to, is, is critical also in thinking about why people aren't acting right now on all the uh, global concerns, in particular the concern that there will be millions of children in, especially in Africa, who will die of starvation in this moment. Uh, and the reason why we're not acting is we have this narrative that these governments are incompetent, they're corrupt, they won't do anything. And I, I think there's always all of those things. There is incompetence, there's incompetence in the US, there's competence in, in France, I, I, I dare, dare say, I, the minister will correct me, uh, but I dare say there is inco some incompetence in France as well. But I, I do think that the broad narrative that governments are incompetent is just false. I mean, if you look at the last 20 years, the, the number of children dying uh, before five has the half. The number of women dying in childbirth has been uh, reduced by 30%. And these are not, these happen not in the richer countries. Didn't, this didn't happen in China, they happened in Africa. Where all, but our narrative is always that these, there are these governments which are corrupt, which are incompetent, let's not do anything therefore, because nothing can be done. I think we have to start by, to transform the world, we have to believe it can be transformed. We have to believe in the possibility that not us, but the whole world can contribute to tr transformation. And if we do, then we can. Thank you very much. Dominique de Villepin, I'm turning to you to conclude the panel, then we'll take the questions from the audience. Now, for a man like you, a political character, you had high responsibilities that we all know. Uh, a man like you who today uh, go around the world ceaselessly, what is the best way to do what we know we have to do and that we are not doing? Arthur Rimbaud in, warned us it can only be the end of the world when we move forward. Therefore, for mankind, we have to pull out of childhood, we have to move on to adulthood and face the rough reality. And let me share three convictions. First, rupture, disruption is necessary. The good old days of transition, of transformation, progressive transformation is gone. Just look at all the plans that multiplied for more than a century. I'm referring to the young plan in 2029 on the rescaling of, of the German repair, uh, which a few weeks later was abandoned because of the crisis of 29. And it was supposed to last until 1988. Many econometric and ecological models, unfortunately, experienced the same fate. Within this context, uh, in my opinion, there are three missed opportunities in the last two years which should lead us to wake up. 
first uh, missed opportunity, the COVID crisis. Ellen and I said it. We had the opportunity for vaccination of the whole world. We didn't do it. Second opportunity missed the war in Ukraine. We could, together with the Versailles summit, of having unanimous decision to decide immediate sanctions that would probably would have allowed a short war. We missed that as well. And third uh, element, the accumulation of deaths that we experience at the scale of the planet, but that's the case in France and in Europe. And we keep being uh, totally uh, addict to debt and to overconsumption. From then on, we have a duty for truth. I was amazed by the reproach made to François Mitterrand and Jacques Chirac to have organized a great lie about Europe. Well, I fear that in the next few years, there will be the same reproach to the current leaders to have organized a great lie about the war, the spiral of the war and its consequences, as well as on the debt at a time where we will have to wake up and unfortunately, future generations will have a high tribute to pay. Therefore, we have to rethink our systems. It is true of democracy. It is true of the market. If only for democracy, and I think the French elections in that respect are a great opportunity, to convey uh, democracy from the simple rule of majority to the consensus, pull out of the democratic myopia to integrate long term and the ch necessary choices. In my opinion, this is a good thing. Second conviction, we need priorities and we need principles. Priorities, we know them, climate, uh, best sharing of uh, better sharing of wealth and uh, better opportunity for all. In that sense, we need to apply the rule of law nationally, internationally. But we need principles which have to be respected and which are essential at the time of resentment. Cynthia Fleury would talk better about that. We are at the days of global resentment with the struggle between the West and emerging countries and with the national resentment with this conflict confrontation between the people and the so-called elite. So come out of this logic of resentment and two ways to do so, two main principles, unity, initial unity of initial community. We cannot allow to enter division games, uh, the, 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 the separations, democracy against autocracy, West versus East, uh, uh, the Occident versus, uh, versus fanatics. All these divisions do not make it possible to overcome the main challenges, and that includes the ecological challenge. Third conviction, we need European leadership. Indeed. What is Europe today? It is a Europe of a battlefield, and it is a variable of adjustment in the, in the world between in the rivalry between China and the U.S. We see the attention in Europe is shifting east. It is fully focused, rightly so, on uh, the war in Ukraine, yet not clearly, while not taking the proper decisions, and sometimes by uh, 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 and, you know, keeping these wars going on. So we have to understand the need for negotiation and compromise. We won't pull out of a crisis without political compromise. And second necessity, the European leadership should be allied with the emerging countries. And I'm, what I'm saying, and I'm the only one to say it, this alliance between Europe and the emerging countries is the only chance for a balance of the planet. We Europeans have no interest for power, power, uh, power but we have the, the, we have the, 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 the sense of uh, global interest and what we have in common. We have to decenter our vision. General de Gaulle did in the middle of the 1665 press conference where he was uh, challenging the hegemony of the dollars. 66 discourse of uh, Phnom Penh uh, contest challenging the US policy in Vietnam. All this is essential because we must uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, get back and be uh, reconquered. I mean, you know, uh, get, get back to the alliance with the emerging. Nobody understands what the European wants, you know. And I was in Africa, in Brazil. Nobody understood what we're doing in Ukraine at the time when, you know, to, you know, they, they deserve Sudan, Ethiopia, and Yemen. So clearly, it is essential that Europe should not lose track of this global vision, whereas the entropy shrinking. Uh, the uh, on our own territories tend to take over. By way of conclusion, we need to do everything to avoid disaster, the disaster, but we must do everything to get ready for it.
Thank you all. Time for questions now. I'm sure we got plenty, many, lots of questions. So, oh, well, clearly we all, uh, you know, sh you know, we're in shock, in awe, in reflection. So, uh, participants are, Madame, we need a microphone, a microphone, Madame. Please introduce yourself and express a short, brief question. I'm Dominique de Gasquet. Uh, I was a teacher in literature and I've been teaching in Delhi University and in Rwanda, in Morocco. And I have a question for you. Um, I think, uh, do you think uh, that education, of course, can transform the world, but um, how can we do it collectively, as said uh, Mr. de Villepin? That means Europe and other countries, emergent countries together. Because I think this is a this is a point. This is important, and I thank you for your uh, communication. Fosia. Well, I think education should no longer be a social. I think there should be more investment. There should be more, you know, focus on education. It should not no longer be a social service. There should be. You know, it should be an area where the government see themselves committed, the private sector, for quality, for connectivity. But in the context of Afghanistan, of course, it's a very different context. We have gone to zero location. And of course, on a personal level, it's heartbreaking for me to remind myself of what's happening in Afghanistan in terms of the education. Because, you know, under the pretext of religion, we are taking back hundreds of years, which even it's not Islamic. What, what Islam says is about education, about acceptance. So I think we have to really open our doors for more scholarship, invest in education, hold the countries accountable the emerging countries for quality education. And in the case of Afghanistan, I think you should continue to push for, for girls' education because right now, even now that we are talking, we have at least six schools inside Afghanistan that are functioning you know, in, on, a, on a private uh, base, but also secretly. It's, you know, as somebody who, who know the value of education, who I am who I am because of my education, now to go back to start teaching girls in private homes is, you know, it's not a nice moment, but this is something we have. So I think you as an individual need to raise your voice for our cause with your government. I know Ukraine is a priority for you all and Afghanistan is no longer making the headlines, but let's remember that these are two different conflicts. The conflict in Afghanistan, if the world did not fail Afghanistan, in a way, it did. You think the war in Ukraine would have happened? I think no. I think if Afghanistan was where it was last year, this time, not controlled by Taliban, the war in Ukraine never had actually started to the extent that it has. Because Europe and West and US lost its moral world leadership, the war in Ukraine started. So if you continue to ignore Afghanistan, and do not focus on, on the needs of the people and raise the voices of us. I know you are tired of speaking about Afghanistan, listening about Afghanistan and listening to us. It has been four decades of war. But I think the more you continue to ignore Afghanistan, the more you will face these consequences or countries like Afghanistan. Thank you. D'autres <laughs> questions? Are there any other questions? Yes, there's one over there. We'll bring you the mic. The lady sitting on the third row. A short question, and please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm a speech therapist, Madame Alouin. This is a question for Cynthia. Where is the problem? Is it not a lack of humility and a lack of empathy in in medicine, in doctors, for example? And should they not? Should doctors not uh, come face to face with the homeless people in order to gain more empathy? Uh, this is a joke often that we often hear. What is uh, the uh, icing on the cake for a doctor? It's when he becomes ill and he wants to be treated differently, and so. They're uh, very different 
a lot of differences in um, medical treatment. So the word which is important is cooperation. And what was said in the round table, this is a question of trust, the need for trust. And over the past 20 years, the way we've been organized on a micro scale have been uh, about rational management, uh, we get a feeling of replaceability, you know, striking some subjects off the discussion list, uh, rather than taking care on our institutions so that we can take care of them, so that we make sure they are sustainable. These institutions must take care of the individuals who we are. So uh, the word robust is very important here as well. We have uh, uh, injected a lot of sentimentality into trust. Trust is the main driver of the economy. It's the driver of a country. It's speed. It's kinetics. So in the times that we have, the time that we have in front of us, are it's, it's making uh, an emergency situation banal and everyday. That's what we're looking towards. It's a question of the unknown, lack of certainty. And faced with that, there's one single thing which will enable us to have uh, a bit of salvation, and that is trust, bravery, values. Because fundamentally, we are not used to managing these new ways of operating, so we have to restore our values and trust. And that's absolutely all determining. This morning, we heard Bruno Le Maire talk about purchasing power. Cooperation is um, the uh, purchasing power of the poorest. Cooperation is the matrix frame for innovation for everybody. So fundamentally, that I'm a researcher and a teacher. I I'm involved in education and healthcare, but all institutions, including businesses, must do this within their own organizations. Two more questions from the floor, the two gentlemen. Thank you very much. I listened to the round table, but I... This is, I'm Philippe Trenard from the Cercle des Economistes. But you said that we have to negotiate and we have to have a notion of compromise. We have to work together, uh, particularly with emerging countries. But on the other hand, what we see in uh, Madame uh, Kofi's country, we see a re total refusal of negotiation. So how on earth do we uh, move forward in this debate? We can see even in our own countries, there's some of the conflict which we are saying between the populace and the elite. It's a conceptualization of another conflict, which is a conflict between those who do want to negotiate and those who don't want to negotiate. So how do we broach this? Because Europe, has it not exhausted its negotiation capacities? Uh, well, first, I think uh, things should not be certain things should not be done, and this is unfortunately the logic we are likely to follow as we in Ukraine, you know, the re regime of change policies. You know, when there are major uh, blockages or when there are attitudes which are uh, that of rejection and sectarianism, that's the case of what we saw in Afghanistan, for example. Well, is the uh, the false uh, logic or the logic of a change of regime? No, it's, you cannot impose democracy through force. This is the uh, lesson we can learn from all the military intervention the last uh, 20, 30 years, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. Second, we need the unity of the international community. This is why nothing can be done without seeking the unity. And it's not unanimity, but for example, just imagine to regulate the major problem of the world without the emerging uh, countries, without China. It's not possible. And in the case that you mentioned, the case of Afghanistan, clearly, first and foremost, and that was uh, this fascinating for the 20 years, the little attention paid by the countries next to Afghanistan to the fate of Afghanistan, and quite to the contrary, many actually, in fact, would uh, stir difficult, uh, add difficulties, and you know, enjoy the difficulty, uh, you know, uh, to, without seeking solution. So we're dealing with different pragmatic strategies, but which in no case should lead Western countries to consider that they have the recipe. You have to play with local 
mediation countries. The emerging countries are very good, including, you know, a country like Belgium can uh, unlock several situations at the European level where there are countries, uh, it could be the case for Ukraine, for China, possibly Israel, possibly the Senegal, which could uh, contribute to this. So those are uh, often indirect strategies, but indispensable, but not confrontation. Accenture uh, CEO for Technology Europe. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to see the panel where I see more uh, women than men in terms of number. And I have to recognize that when I look to other panels, in particular CEO of company, it was more men. So nothing against men, I'm part of them. But when we look to solutions, we talk about caring about the world, caring about the planet, caring about the people, caring about the citizen. Who are the best to fix and propose ideas and implement them? I have to say, because that's where what we have seen from some of you, they are women. And in some places, like, like there are rules to get more women at board, there are rules to get maybe more women in every government, but it's not done. So what collectively, and the question can be for women and for men, what can we collecti collectively do to accelerate the position of women at leadership position to take decision, to care more about the planet, the people, the citizen, everyone, and fix the objectives set by the, those two, two days. Thank you. Merci. Qui veut répondre à cette question Who would like to answer this C'est simple, hein, donc c'est... Well, it's quite easy, as far as I can see. University, uh, it's the, we've hardly got sex equality at universities. It's uh, yet another sexist uh, stronghold. There is a lot of room for, for maneuver. We are working specifically with our PhD students. But it's true, we are getting more women in the different bodies and the roles of professors and all of the positions of responsibility, we're getting more women up there, but it is a, a challenge and it's a challenge that is uh, present also in other parts of the economy. We see that as soon as we're talking about engineering, science, etc., there is still a, a, a lot of um, work to be done. We have to be offensive, but just take a look at medicine. But today, girls are in the lead, and you will mainly have uh, lady doctors treating you in a few years' time. And that is often a sign, sadly, that uh, the profession is going to be earning less money. So having more women in the profession isn't always very, very easy. But these are uh, resilient zones. We've got professors, universities, etc., which are very resilient. And so we have to get women in there as well. They have to be able to enter into that zone, particularly in France here. There's another gentleman with a question there. Hello. Shapiro One, I'm a student at Ex Marseille University. I've got a question for everybody. It's a transversal question. It's about trust. The question of trust has uh, come up several times. I'd like to take uh, the example of COVID, where there was a duel between uh, the people and uh, the elites, but what about a government that uh, when the government says it's not going to extend the health pass to everyday activities, but then goes ahead and does it quite soon after that? How can you trust politicians when they say anything, when they uh, do what they say they're not going to do? Thank you very much for that very important question. I'm going to ask uh, Dominique de Villepin this. Uh, you uh, went through it's a poisonous gift here, poison gift. You were responsible for uh, public policy and uh, trust with the voters. This is a question which you uh, had a close brush with. You mentioned this when you were speaking earlier on. You pointed out that increasing feeling. How can we combat that increasing feeling in our democracies? 
I think the uh, the main recipe, should there be one, it is to tell the truth. This is what makes the work of governance so difficult in the in its demand for modesty and results. But the duty for truth is to consider that uh, the problem as perceived by the leader has to be understood by the one who is governed by the citizen. And it is the gap which is very wide in a country like France with a lot of hierarchy, centralization, and country which is often uh, bro uh, blocked with habits. So this is what we still have to do. And the, the, the f we're very fortunate in the last election in that it, the, now this work is mandatory. There is no possible action of the government of the president without uh, going for a trust of a large part of the national representations and of the population. So in that respect, there is an obligation for imagination. There is work of compromise, which is imposed as a initial rule, while the temptation often is to govern from uh, you know, top down and sometimes from too high. Mr. Banerjee, you know, you have comment, comments to make on the question of trust. You did mention it too. I, I guess I, I think the spirit of the question, in a sense, is I, I think already founded in the lack of trust. Because in many, many ways, you want the governments to be flexible. I think to say today, we in something like COVID, where we didn't know anything about its, its uh, transmission ability, uh, the fact that there were new variants and and how uh, you know how costly it is to our health it, it must be that we you know if we really had trust in government we would say look yes say what you think today and change your mind i think part of our problem is precisely that we are so suspicious of governments that they they're scared of changing their mind they stick to something too often rather than i'm not actually i think the I sort of have the opposite view to you, that I think the really costly thing is a certain kind of stubbornness because we, in a sense, are so uh, scared of, of uh, you know, uh, saying that, look, we didn't know. Uh, we, 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 we learned with new things came out. And I think the, the, the core of trust is when we can say we, are, we were wrong, but now we can be right. And I, till, till we get there, in a sense, I think changing your mind is, uh, you know, is very difficult for people in authority. And in a sense, it undermines their ability to be good. Marine, for the last word. In your presentation earlier on, you had a very strong phrase when you uh, shared your experience and uh, the fact that you built uh, this beautiful project over 20 years. You said, at times, we have to, uh, uh, to shake the, the hands of the devil. Is that necessary? Well, indeed. When I go out into the field, I cannot become uh, involved. I, uh, I Stand, I put myself in the shoes of the child with no legs and, and in the shoes of the Taliban. I know who they are. I know where they come from. The younger Taliban, for example, I know who they are. They're orphans who were forced to go off and study in the madrasa in uh, Pakistan, the enemy, if you like. And uh, then uh, they were told to go out and spread the good word of Islam. The same for the Russians today. I covered the war in Georgia, Chechnya. And I saw who these kids were. They went off to wage war. They're uh, not paid. They come from uh, the from zones which are far away from Putin's power. And they've got all kinds of uh, uh, cysts and kists on their on their bodies. They really were very envious of the food we were eating. I was with some French soldiers, and they were jealous of the food we had. And I'm not seeing monsters when I have that knot of fear in my stomach and when I have some French soldiers with me and I go and shake hands with the Taliban to get them to understand that we can have shared values, sacred values. Children are sacred and they need to help us. Hospitals in the area were all blown up. Ours wasn't blown up. And I don't know because it's 
because we had that exchange or because I gave my word, but sooner or later you have to know how to make peace. We're all fed up of all these endless wars. Let it stop. Thank you, Marine. Thank you, everybody, for being with us for this panel session. We've talked about the problems of the world. Now we're going to talk about some solutions. And the, way, the moment you've all been waiting for, this is the Circle des Economies Declaration. I'm going to ask uh, the headman himself to come up and make that declaration.